Hi there, my name is Christopher Natsume, and I am the creative director and co-founder of a company called BoomZap Entertainment. BoomZap Entertainment is a casual game development studio. We make games for Android and PC and stuff like that. We've been running the studio about 15 years, and I'm in the middle of a video series. This is actually the fifth of a series of five videos talking about how we run that studio. And what's interesting to most people is we're a completely virtual studio. So everybody lives and works at home. We don't have a physical space anywhere. And we've done this for quite a long time. We've done this for 15 years. We've shipped like 50 games like this. We've made millions of dollars. It's been a very successful venture. And obviously now with everything that's going on in the world, a lot of people are looking at how can they be working from home better? And obviously this is something that we've been doing a very long time. We have a lot of processes and things about that. Now, in the other videos, I talked more at a corporate level or a company level. In the first video, I talked about why you might want to do this. And, and it's my belief that it's not just because we have a, you know, a, a biblical level plague falling across the world. There are good reasons to run a virtual studio beyond that. And I talked about a lot of those reasons in the first video. In the second video, I talked about a lot of the reasons why people say that this can't happen or it's not a good idea. And I walked through uh, the sort of uh, uh, ways that people might resist you trying to do this and the kind of answers you might have for them and the kind of solutions that we've had for those kind of problems where they were real problems. In the third video, I talked a lot about the actual processes that we use, the way that we hire people, the way that we manage people, the way that we manage projects and do tasking and that sort of thing. And in the fourth video, I actually went into some depth about the exact tools that we use in the studio and how we use them and how you can effectively use those tools in the kind of setup that we have. So I've been through all of that. I wanted to finish the series with a much more personal video about how I work. Not the whole studio, but me personally here in my home office in Yokohama, Japan. How do I work? How do the people that I work with in the studio work? How do we be most effective in this? And I think for right now, this is a lot of the answers that a lot of people are looking for because they're suddenly thrust into this work from home situation and they're trying to figure out how do I make this work? How do I deal with this? So I'm going to go through in some detail what I do and how I do it and how I make this a successful thing for me here. Now, Again, as I said in the other videos, not all of this is necessarily uh, applicable to you. Maybe some of this is great, maybe some of it's not. Some other people work differently. And in particular, this, this video, this part of the series, this is where there's a lot of personal taste involved in how individuals might handle this might be differently from person to person. This is how I handle it. Um, I've been very successful and very happy in this model, so I'll give you that. But you may find, you know, your mileage may vary. So in any case, the, the number one thing that I think I made sure to do uh, from the very beginning, and I, I found it to be very important for the last 15 years, is to have a really, really nice workspace. And you can actually see, this is my home office behind me. Um, this is the attic of my mother-in-law's house in Yokohama, Japan. This is where I do all of my work. I'm very happy up here. And I wanna talk a little bit about this particular space. So I spend most of my working life sitting here at this desk. And so first of all, I make sure that the chair that I'm sitting in here is a good one. This is actually my father-in-law's old chair. It's a very comfortable chair and it's not a particularly expensive one, but having a nice good chair to sit in, having a nice desk, this is actually a, a quite large desk. Um, I actually have my laptop set up here on a stand so that's nice up and my, my head is forward and not bounding down over a laptop. I have actually two other large monitors here and here. I have a wireless keyboard, a wireless mouse that's hooked up to all of this. So I have a full size keyboard and I'm when I'm sitting here, my, my monitors are lifted up so I have, have them at eye level and I have good posture and I can sit and I can work. I actually have my microphone set up on a little microphone stand that's attached to the side of the desk. I have a nice little uh, stereo here next to me. All of this sets up a really nice, happy working environment. And if you don't have that, you're going to struggle against it. So this is the first thing I suggest to everybody. And, and you're gonna spend a lot of time here. So it's worth sacrificing some of your house to make this happen. Now, I'm lucky enough that I have this entire attic up here. And it's a quite large attic uh, to have be my own space and to work up here. So I, that's a, a certain level of privilege here. I know not everyone has a space this big, but for me, I, I managed to make this space. 
I actually don't have a door in this space. My old office and my old house did have a door and I, I used to tell everyone, you need to have a door. I actually have a staircase without a door that goes downstairs. And I kind of wish I had a door because sometimes the noise is a little bit loud from down there and it's a little bit distracting. I would suggest if you can put yourself behind a door, it is really useful to be able to shut that door and say, hey, I need to concentrate right now and I need you to leave me alone. Um, and if the outside world starts to intrude, the kids get loud, the TV, whatever, all that, it's really nice to have that barrier. Um, because I'm up on the third floor, I don't really worry about it so much because the second floor of this house is pretty empty unless uh, people are sleeping. There's really not many people there. So it works out all right for me. The other thing I would say is um, you probably should have a good set of headphones. Now I have uh, these earbuds here that I use and I use them, uh, they're actually noise, noise canceling. They're nice uh, and they're light. And I can hook those into either uh, my computer here or sometimes I actually uh, use wireless earbuds so that I can not have a wire around me. But importantly, I've got something I can put in my ears where, look, I don't want to hear what's going on and I want that to go away. I actually have a bigger pair of headphones over there that I, I use on my, my electronic drum set a lot. And when, I, when it gets loud downstairs and I really want it to be quiet, they're nice big over the ears headphones. I put those on and I, the world is gone to me and I can concentrate. And I know it's, I know that's really particular, but um, reducing distractions is really important. And all of this is based around reducing distractions. Having an uncomfortable chair and being uncomfortable is going to be distracting. You're going to feel bad and you're going to get up and you're going to walk away. Having a little tiny desk without enough room to put your notes and your pens and your things and to work properly, that's going to be distracting and it's going to make it uncomfortable for you to work. Having uh, cables and stuff, only having one little tiny monitor. I know a lot of people when they go home, they bring out their laptop and they put their one little laptop on a little tiny desk and they try to work on that laptop and they get uh, pain in their neck, they get pain in their back, uh, they don't have extra monitors to put other stuff on. This is all relatively important stuff. Um, now, this being said, um, some people have a different tolerance for distraction, and some people in our company actually tolerate a lot more distraction than I do. They, they can handle smaller working spaces or smaller desks. This is a, a personal thing. For me, having this big space and having all of this is very important. Um, some people I know in our studio actually prefer to work in cafes, and this is something you have to test and see. Obviously, right now, working in cafes isn't really an option, but you know, this is uh, hopefully that time will be over and we'll be able to go to Starbucks again someday. Uh, but most people, I think, as a general rule, benefit from reducing distractions, ensuring that they're really comfortable, and minimizing the number of outside influences while they work. Um, and incredibly, uh, as I've talked about in other videos, when people talk about, like, I'm really distracted at home, look, having a TV and some kids and some family in the house with me is order of magnitude less distracting and less disturbing than most often open office floor plans are. Oh my God, I've had to work at other people's studios and just having all these people moving around and walking around and talking and meetings and all that. Whoa, there's so much distraction. And so even with the level of distraction that you have working from home, if you compare it to most open, open office floor plans, it's actually a lot better. Um, so good chair, good desk, good headphones. I actually suggest a couple extra monitors, a real mouse, a real keyboard. If you can find yourself a room with a door that closes, that's even better. Um, all of that is pretty critical to success. So as much of that as you can do, the better. Um, the second thing I would say, uh, you know, we talked about all those distractions. I would also make sure that you're minimizing your digital distractions as well, right? Nothing on my computer makes noise. Nothing on my phone makes noise. No application has pop-up notifications turned on. My phone doesn't have any ringer turned on. It has no notifications. Nothing happens. Unless I actively go look at something, nothing interrupts my day. Now, I obviously, I manage a lot of people on my team and I do need to know when they need to know things. And so I take short, regular breaks between tasks to go check internal company chat groups, um, I take fewer breaks to maybe, you know, take a little break and go look at Facebook or something like that. But none of those things have the 
ability on my digital devices to ring a bell or to open a pop-up or do anything that's going to distract me because I want to make sure that I'm super focused on what I'm doing. When I'm working, that time is mine and short of some, you know, minor emergency, I don't allow any kind of interruptions. And, you know, th this gets back to all of this. All of this is my back hurting is a distraction. My comfortable, uh, my uncomfortable chair is a distraction. My uncomfortable desk is a distraction. My computer going bing, bing, bing and popping. My phone ringing. All of that. Get rid of all of that so that you can really focus down on your work, right? The next thing I would say that's really critical to making working from home uh, a viable, good, happy experience is to get a routine and to stick to it. And when you start, you're not going to know what your best routine is. You're going to figure out your, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. You're going to figure out your best routine over time, but I will give you a, a start and we'll talk in a minute about tracking. I actually have these cool little pieces of paper that I make for myself. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it actually has the day broken down into two hour lines. And I like to kind of figure out at the beginning of the day, what am I going to do with each two hour block of my life today? Right. And I've got a couple scheduled out. Um, I've got the noon to two o'clock uh, broken out. That's uh, when I go eat lunch and I check my Facebook and I catch up on my email. And that's my little social hour for me. There's two hours for me. And I, I walk away from the computer. I go downstairs. I have my, my, my lunch. I cook my lunch. I prepare some stuff for dinner. And that's a little two hour break for me every day. That's where I, you know, socialize with my family. It's where I socialize online. It's where I get my food. And that's, that's a ritual for me. Every day at noon, that thing happens. And because I have that thing every day at noon, now I look at what do I do for the two hours before that and the two hours before that? Because there's about four hours. You know, I usually wake up and, and kind of by the time I've showered and got started and gotten with my day, it's about eight o'clock in the morning. And so I've got that eight to 10 and that 10 to 12 block. And I have those sort of broken off for those are my big morning tasks. And I'm going to do those big morning tasks, those 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 two blocks. So I give myself two big blocks of time because two hours is a lot. You get a lot done in two hours, right? So here's a two hour block. Here's another two hour block. And I try very hard because I, and, and it's very important that I have that noon deadline in front of me because I know I need to get done before then because that's when I go have lunch, right? And so that, that ritual, that routine pushes me along and says, Hey, Chris, you really need to get some stuff done this morning because lunch is coming and you know, you're supposed to have the stuff done by lunch, right? I have another two hour block and another two hour block. So a two to four and a, a, a four to six hour block in the afternoon. And that's two more great big tasks, right? I can fill a lot into those two, two hour blocks at six o'clock. I actually do all the cooking for my family. And so I go downstairs and I cook dinner and I, you know, prepare everything. And between cooking dinner and having dinner with my family, and again, having a little bit of social time or maybe taking a little personal time to read a book or something like that, that's another sort of two hour bit of life. Now, after that, uh, depending on where I am with other things, maybe I'll go do some more work, maybe I'll do something else. But th that, that bit right there, two two hour blocks of work, a two hour block of lunch, two more two hour blocks of work, another two hour block of dinner and, and whatever. That's most of my working day. And if you add it up, that's what, two, four, six, eight, that's a good eight hours worth of work every day. And that's a, that's a very nice, easy to keep schedule. If I do that religiously every day, I find myself to be um, really, really successful. Now, I give you that free of charge. That's one way that you could work. You may find that you work differently. Something's better for you. But I suggest that however it is that you figure out that you work well, um, do it. <laughs> do it every single day. Get in the ritual. Get in the habit. Otherwise, you're going to find you're sleeping a little bit later. You're taking a little bit longer lunches. Your dinners kind of stretch out, blah, 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 blah. And suddenly you realize it's the end of the day and all what you got done. If you have a sort of ritual and a routine, it will really empower you in working at home. And this is something that we naturally have when we go into an office because the office forces it on us. And so this allows you to force your own ritual, your own routine on yourself, right? Um, as part of uh, all of this, I would suggest that you schedule everything a lot more than you probably do right now. You are unproductive usually because you are not focused and a schedule gives you focus. And the most important part about your schedule is that 
You need to finish the thing that you're working on right now because you have another thing scheduled soon. I work really hard in the morning because I have lunch scheduled at noon and I'm walking away for lunch at noon. I work very hard in the afternoon because I have dinner scheduled at six and I need to go down there. My, my wife comes home from work. My kids are done with doing what they're doing. At seven o'clock or so, they're at the table waiting to eat. And if I haven't made them dinner, I'm in trouble, right? So I need to go at six. And if I need to go at six, that means I'm not going to screw around between two and six because that's a solid block of work. And that's when I have time to go do work. Actually putting those end points on yourself pushes you to make that thing happen. But I would suggest scheduling more than just that. Um, I One big thing is uh, you should probably be realistically scheduling some exercise during the day. Um, you know, pick two or three days and say, look, I'm going to have dinner and after dinner, I'm going to exercise or maybe, and this is one of the great benefits of working from home. Maybe between lunch and dinner on Fridays, you go to take a walk or take a bike ride or do something like that. If you put that in your schedule and you plan around that in your schedule, that's going to push you to move your work somewhere else because you're saying, well, okay, I'm doing this here and I'm doing this here. I got to make sure I work somewhere else. That scheduling is going to be very important in keeping you motivated and keeping you moving. I schedule everything. I schedule when I'm going to talk with people. I schedule, uh, you know, sometimes I want to take my wife out for a date. I schedule date nights and, you know, we go out on those times. I have guitar lessons that I take with my daughter and I put those in the schedule. I have you know times when I meet with people. All of that is put in a schedule. And I'm very rigorous about keeping to this schedule because that makes sure that those blocks of time that I have scheduled to do work, that's when I have to work. And it pushes me to make that thing happen. Um, now, a corollary to that, this thing right here that I showed you, this isn't actually my schedule. This is my time tracker. And there's a difference between a schedule and a time tracker. I don't actually write on this what I'm going to do. I write on this what I did. And that's a very different thing because I need to be knowing today, did I keep to my schedule? Did I do the things that I said I was going to do? Are the assumptions I'm making about how long it takes to do a task correct? I'll give you a very good example. I've been working on the sound for a couple games that we're working on right now. And I had scheduled a couple days to do this. And so every time I sit down and I do a two hour block of working on the music and the sound for these games, I write down here, that's what I did from two o'clock till four o'clock. I worked on the sound for uh, last regiment. And I thought this would take me a few days, but I can go back and look at the last week of these and I can see, holy crap, this took a lot of two hour blocks. This is a much longer, bigger job than I thought it was going to be. And now when I need to plan that thing in the future, I have a much better idea of how long these things are going to take me. The more you track that time and track what you did, the better your future assumptions of your time are going to be. And that makes me incredibly effective. The other thing it does is it keeps me from screwing around too much. Because if I have to track, and I on this, I actually track every half hour. I, I, if, if I do anything for a half hour, it goes on the time tracker. And you know what? If I sit here and screw around on the internet and look at Facebook for a half hour, I force myself to write down on that time tracker, screwed around, you know, looked at Facebook, played World of Warcraft. I don't play World of Warcraft anymore, but uh, you know, whatever it is I did for a half hour, I got to write that down. And if you get to the end of the day and you look at your little time tracker and you see that it's completely full of looking at the internet, watching some Netflix, reading a book, you know, you, suddenly you start to feel pretty bad about yourself and you say, wow, this is, this is really ineffective. And you stop doing it. It's actually, a, you know, it, it, and this is, this is uh, very, uh, real science. So the, the, the psychology of this is very real. It's the same thing. If you want to lose weight, and th there's been many studies that have shown this, the first thing you need to do is just write down all the food that you eat. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to say that you're going to do anything and no diet or anything. Just write down everything that you eat. And the act of having to write down, I just ate another piece of cheesecake, you're going to naturally stop eating so much damn cheesecake, right? And it's the same with wasting your time. And so I strongly suggest... Um, you know, you can make anything. This is just a stupid little thing I made in, uh, uh, I don't know, I made it in Google uh, Slides and made a bunch of these and printed them out and I cut them up. I know I could do this on the computer, but I actually like doing it on paper because the tactile sensation of picking up a pen and writing screwed around for half an hour, it's, it's very powerful. And so having this here where I can just quickly write a note to myself. And then next to me here on the desk, I've got a little shelf. You can see here's, here's the last, um, you know, I've got, I make little books. Of, of seven days each. And here's the last, I don't know, a couple months of me 
recording what I've done. And I can go back and I can look and I can say, I wonder how long it took me to do that. I wonder how long it... it's actually very useful. And I know some people are really into digital stuff and they'll say, you could digitize all that. And you could, it's probably better to do it digital. But I actually, I like the tactile sensation of writing. So that's the only real reason why I do it in paper. But doing that tracking is actually really nice and really important. Um, I usually um, make sure if I, if I get to the point where I write down on this thing, I just spent 30 minutes screwing around. Usually my first reaction to that is to get up and walk away. And I'll talk about that for a minute. A, kind of a rule that I follow is if I'm at this desk, I'm working, right? This is a workspace. This is kind of a, a special space. If I'm here, I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm not uh, playing video games. I'm, this is my workspace. If I want to go look at Facebook, I have an iPad. I go downstairs, I sit on the couch, I look at the iPad. If I want to read a book, I've actually got a Kindle and I go sit down and in, in, in the easy chair and I read in my Kindle. I don't do those things here at this desk. And it's, it's very Pavlovian to say, when I sit here, I'm going to do work. And it, it's, it's, it's like a sacred workspace for me. And the more you can do that, the more you will do that. And if you find yourself screwing around in your workspace, that's your body or your mind or your soul telling you, hey man, take a break. And so if I do write down, you know, screwed around for half an hour, I will get up from the space, I will go downstairs and I will do something else. Maybe I'll cut the vegetables for dinner tonight or maybe I'll, you know, rearrange my sack drawer or whatever. I'll, I'll do just something to clear my head and then I'll come back up here a little bit refreshed and I'll get back to work. Right? It's very difficult to write down, screwed around for 30 minutes. Okay, but this next 30 minutes is going to be different. I promise you, baby. Like, it, it doesn't really work like that. Your, your mind's already gone somewhere. Um, I take walks sometimes when I'm, I'm a little bit flustered or that sort of thing. Um, take a little break. Now, I know a lot of people, when they, when they start working from home, you imagine that what's going to happen is you're not going to sit down and work and that's going to be a problem. You will find over time that the actual problem is, is that you will sit down to work and you'll suddenly be working, you know, 14, 15, 16 hour days, but you're not getting very much done. And you think to yourself, wow, why is this happening? And this is why I track my time. Because if you actually do that and you look, what you'll find is you're not working 14, 16 hour days. You're sitting at this desk for 14 or 16 hours, but you're actually doing about four hours of work a day because your mind is just in a different place and you're not concentrating and you're not focused down. Um, and what will happen after you do that for a couple weeks is you will start feeling like work is eating you alive. You'd be like, I, all I do is work. But I'm telling you, if you look at the tracking sheet, it's not all you're doing. Actually, you're doing a whole lot of stuff that's not work, but because you're sitting in your workspace and you're doing it, you think you're doing work all the time and you get really frustrated and angry and you think, my life is just work. That will happen to you working from home if you are not careful. Um, and I know a lot of people in the studio have little rituals to let them know today is over. The work for today is over. Now me, I actually like doing work at night. So I usually reserve a couple two hour blocks uh, between like 10, you know, I'm actually right now it's, it's 920 at night in Japan. And this is one of my working blocks is after I've had my dinner and I have spent some time with the family at eight o'clock, I come up and do at least another two hours worth of work from eight to 10. Or if I'm feeling like I really need to get some work done, I do another two hour block from 10 to midnight. And I'm actually very successful, uh, during those times, but other people don't want to work these times. So a lot of people create a ritual to say, this is when I'm stopping work for today. For me, my ritual is when it's time for me to stop work, I go downstairs, I grab my Kindle and I sit down in my easy chair and I read a little bit of a book. And at that point, I've just said to myself, I'm done. I'm not upstairs. I'm not doing work. Work is over for me today. My business partner, Alan, his done with work is he opens up a beer and sits down with a beer and he says, look, I'm a coder. I'm not programming drunk. I've had a beer now. And at a certain point in the day, that's the end of his work. And I suggest as part of your ritual, you have a defined moment that you say, that's it. I'm done with work today. Um, whatever it is, that's that's up to you. But I suggest having one. Um, one sort of big part of all that, as I said, this is a sacred space. This is where I work. Don't eat here. Don't don't eat in your workspace. And there's a lot of good reasons not to eat. Right. The number one good reason not to eat is holy shit, you will get fat. You will get so fat working from home if you start eating at your desk and you will hate yourself for it. And anyone who knows anything about nutrition knows it's very difficult to exercise off food, right? Fighting 
food with exercise is a very difficult combination. And guess what? You're working from home, which means unless you're planning and scheduling that exercise, you're getting less exercise than you used to. You're not even riding a train to work. You're not even walking to your car anymore. Uh, and we'll get back to that, that part in a minute. But I can promise you, if you start eating at this desk and snacking at this desk, keeping a little bowl of food here, you will get fat. Don't do that. Right. The other thing it will do, though, aside from your your workspace will get filthy and your keyboard will get full of crumbs and it's nasty. And we've actually had people in our studio have infestations of ants in their computers because they've they've had problems uh, not eating at the desk. But the other thing that will happen is you will get kind of distracted with your food because, you know, you can't type if you're, you're shoving crap in your mouth. So you start shoving crap in your mouth and you think, OK, while I'm eating this, you know, maybe I'll eat, eat dish, I'll eat lunch at my desk to save time. So you show up at your desk with your little bit of food and now you open up Netflix on your desk because, hey, it's lunchtime and I'm eating. Why not watch some Netflix? And the next thing you know, it's five hours later and you've binged watched a season of Better Call Saul. Right. The food will start you down that that path. It's like a, like a little Satan that will drive you in the wrong direction. When it's time to eat, get up, go sit at a table like a civilized adult and eat in your eating space and save this space for work. Uh, I promise you that will, that will help. Now about how I work, as I talked before, I work in sprints. I work in two hour sprints. And so I have, and those are scheduled sprints. I have a sprint from eight to 10. I have a sprint from 10 to noon. I have another sprint from two to four and another sprint from four to six. That's my ritual. And that's four good solid hunks of time. And two hours is a lot of time. You can get a lot done in two hours if you put your mind to it. And when I'm looking at my tasks, I try to break them down into two hour or maybe four hour tasks, but no, no bigger than four hours. So if I've got a really big task, I ask myself, how can I break that down into four hour, two hour parts? And I do those parts. When I'm in one of those parts, I try very hard not to get distracted. I don't go to Slack and talk to other people unless they summon me and need me to do something. I don't get involved in other conversations. I don't open any browsers or anything. I try to keep one task at a time, do that task. I know people talk a lot about multitasking. The science on that is pretty clear that nobody multitasks very well. We think we do, but we don't. What we really do well is task switch. And we tasks, you know, when you think you're multitasking, you're not really multitasking, you're task switching. And with creative work, that task switching will take all that creative juice that you've got for one task and kill it because you've got to load up all the creative juice for task two. And if you're task switching one, two, one, two, one, two, you're actually going to lose a lot of time in that switching. So I strongly suggest that you work in sprints. I, I like a, I like a two hour time limit for a sprint. That's long enough for you to really get deep into something, really get involved in something, but not long enough that you're going to get burnt out. Um, and try to finish that before you do something else. And every time you finish one of those sprints, take a little break, right? At the end of those two hour sprints, I, you know, and they're not usually a full two hours. Usually I'll finish a little bit before the two hours and I'll take that leftover time and go over to Slack and talk to the team. What are you doing? Is there anything you need? Answer some questions. Maybe check my email and see if there's anything that's come in that I need to deal with with that. Um, I do those sort of uh, still work, but not task related events. I do those at the end of each one of those sprints and that keeps me very focused and keeps me working very well. Um, if you're not summoned, leave Slack alone or whatever your company communication channel is, right? There's probably some stuff going on on there, but if nobody asked you to answer a question, they probably don't need your input right now. And whatever input you're going to give them can probably wait until the end of one of those two hour blocks. And so in our studio, you know, if I need Adrian to tell me something, or I need Javi to tell me something, I will, I will t write at Adrian at Javi. They'll get a, they'll, they'll, they'll know. Right. And that's the one bit of distraction that I leave on my machine is I will allow a silent pop-up for that. So as I'm working, I see a little thing in the corner of my screen that says, Adrian asked you a question and I can finish writing my sentence or doing whatever I'm doing. I can go over to Slack and answer that. But if I don't see that, I don't go to Slack until the end of one of my two hour sprints. And at that point I can go through each one of the channels, kind of catch myself up, maybe go downstairs, get a, get a, you know, refill my tea, uh, you know, take a leak, do whatever I need to do, come back. And then it's time for another two hour sprint. I suggest that strongly. Um, I would suggest that in the morning, now part of, we talked about it in one of the other videos, part of the way that we work in this studio 
is everybody has a daily uh, task list. You know, the first thing you do in the morning is you let everyone on the team know, this is what I'm doing today. I would suggest that whatever you're doing today is no more than three tasks, right? Now, I know I just told you that I have four big hunks of time. Usually one of those hunks of time is going to be caught up with uh, doing meetings or talking to somebody, having a conversation about something, blah, 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 blah. Usually I have three of those blocks free to do something. I'm going to add this bunch of sounds. I'm going to revise this document. I'm going to put together this budget, something like that. Usually I've got enough time in the day to complete three things. Any more than three things, you're probably not getting them done. And like everything else, you want to consistently be giving yourself successes. That's how you're going to feel good. That's how you're going to continue working. And so if you start the day by saying, here's what I'm going to do today. Here's my daily task. I'm going to do these three bullet points. And you end your day with your daily report and say, yep, I did these three things. That's going to be a win for you. And if you have a week of consolidated wins, that's going to start feeling very good for you. And you're going to feel very positive and you're going to feel very successful. And that's going to roll over into actual success. So I suggest that's a, that's a good goal is three things a day. And I promise you, most people don't get three good things done every day. Um, the other thing is, if you put a list of these are the three things I'm going to do today, you have a finishing point, right? And, and again, a lot of people think that the real problem from working from home is going to be not working enough. A lot of the real problem is going to be that you're going to let your life and your work intermingle and your work is going to take over your life and that's going to make you unhappy. If I say at the beginning of the day, these are the three things I'm going to do today and I finish those three things, I can now go get that beer or sit down and read that book or go out and have dinner with my family or whatever it is I want to do. I can now say, yep, done, did my thing for today. I can call it a day. I can leave the space. I can get on with my life. That's a very useful thing to do. The next thing I, I want to um, kind of be clear about, this is a real problem I think people have. You have to come to a negotiated agreement with your family about what you're doing. You need to let them know that what you're doing here is work. And when you are in this sacred space, when you're at this workspace that you've made for yourself, you are at work just as much as if you had gotten in a car and drove into work. And if you would not have gotten on the phone and called me and asked me this question, then please don't come over to this desk and bother me while I'm working, right? The only thing that you should interrupt me for here at this desk is something that's important enough that if I was downtown in a studio, you would have called me and asked that question. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, and, and this, you know, this isn't 1983 where we don't have cell phones and we don't have text messages. If you were working in a studio in downtown Seattle, you probably would get text messages every now and then from your wife. And actually, that's how you should probably be working with your family. If they have something that they just, that they would have text messaged you before, ask them to text, text message it to you now. And it will show up on one of these monitors and you can look at it and say, okay, I'll get back to that and maybe type and say, yeah, I'll do that a little bit later. Even if she's sitting right there. Right? Even if your, your wife is sitting just right on the other side of the room, it's much more polite for her to do that because she knows that you're concentrating, you get your headphones on, you're doing stuff, but she had some stuff that she needed you to know. And okay, there it is. It's on that monitor. I'll deal with that later. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but if you can get yourself into that system, you can minimize those distractions and you can be successful. Now, one of the great parts about working from home is you do get to spend time with your family and the people that you care about. I go downstairs, you know, now that my wife is working from home because of the, the coronavirus and whatnot, I actually get to have lunch with my wife during the day. And that's wonderful. We sit down, we have a lunch together. Uh, I get to have dinner with my whole family every day. I don't, I, you know, there's no working late, not going to have dinner. Dinner's right downstairs. I go downstairs and cook it. We have dinner together. And at the end of one of those two hour work uh, things, if I need to go, you know, if, if my wife was like, hey, I need to talk to you about this thing. Hey, I can go downstairs. I can talk to her about that thing. If my daughter wants to something, I can deal with that. But they need to know that when you're in this space, that is that is a sacred space. That's you working and them interrupting you here is the same as interrupting you at work. You need to return that agreement by saying, look, I understand that I am at home and you can see me and I'm not going to be a jerk about it. And if you do need me to answer a question, I will get to it. Look, I'm working in these little two hour blocks. If, if I get to the end of a block and there's something that needs to be dealt with, okay, I'll go deal with it. I'll take a little break and help you clean the fridge or, or whatever it is you need. I can do that thing. But there needs to be an agreement between you and your family or whoever it is that you live with that that 
that you're here and that you're working and that this work is, you know, how you're getting paid right now. Um, I know a lot of people struggle with this, especially with large extended families. We have a lot of people in our studio who work from the Philippines and a lot of people in the Philippines live in, you know, large multi-generational families with lots of brothers and sisters and things like that. And there is a natural inclination to say, well, you know, so-and-so is working from home. You know, she can do this work around the house and she could take care of this and, oh, she can go pick somebody up from the store and, oh, she can do all that stuff. You need to sit down and have the talk with them and negotiate out and say, look, I can do all of that, but I can do that on my schedule. And I will schedule time for that, right? And because I don't want I don't want to lose the value of you being able to do that, right? I mean, that, that's one of the values of working from home is you can do those things. But that needs to be put on a schedule and you need to say, yes, yes, I can go pick. You know, for instance, we have one guy in our studio who lives in Malaysia and he's essentially a, a, a stay-at-home house husband. He takes care of the kids. He takes the kids to school. He picks the kids up from school. He cooks dinner. He does all of those things. Now he works a schedule around where he has his work blocks put together and everyone in the studio knows from this time to this time he's gone to go pick up his kids he does that every single day he leaves a little message hey i'm going to pick up my kids everybody knows that that's that's a thing that he's negotiated out with us and negotiated out with his you know with his team and with his family how he's going to work and that's fine right but if they start interrupting him and say and, and coming in outside of those blocks of time that he's negotiated out with them that's a problem right? And that's how you're successful in this. And I, I don't want to say, you know, you can't take care of your family or you can't go pick your kids up from school. Or the, the joy of working from home is that you can do those things, but that needs to be scheduled just like everything else. And the people who are involved in your life need to know that there are these blocks of time where you're working, you've got your headphones on or the door is closed. And during those periods of time, I really need to be left alone and I really need to do what I'm doing. That's a conversation you need to have with people in your family. And it's a lot easier to have that conversation if you've negotiated your part of it and said, yeah, I do understand that I'm home and I do understand that you need these things done and I will do those things and here's the schedule on which I will do them. That's a, that's a, a much better conversation than a, a screaming argument about, oh, don't you understand that I'm at work? Ah! That's not going to get you anywhere good. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, and this may not sound obvious as part of a work from home, whatever, but I do find that it's a big part of my life, a big part of my success. And I want to, I want to put it in here as I'm talking about you know, as I'm winding up, we're, we're to the last two points of everything I'm talking about in this video series. So I, these are a little bit more personal, but they're things that are important to me that I want to share with you. And I put in my schedule time to help other people. And I want to be very clear about that. Some of those people are people that I work with, right? Some of the time that I schedule, when I say I only do three things a day, but I've got, you know, between four and six work blocks, depending on how long I want to work each day, um, a lot of those work blocks involve me going around to the team and asking people in the team, hey, I looked at your stuff and do you have the tools that you need or, you know, you need to, as a manager, you need to take some time to reach out to your team and make sure that you're supporting them and you're getting them what you need. But, and, and this, this replaces, if you were in a brick and mortar studio, there would be that time where you walked around the office and you talked to people, right? And quite honestly, in most offices, that's pretty annoying. You know what it's like as a worker to, to have your boss stop by your cubicle and, you know, and put your fingers in your suspenders and how are you doing it? Like, that's annoying and nobody likes that. But having your boss check in every now and then and notice that you're doing work and say, hey, you know, I looked at that art you did last week. It's really good. Um, is there, you know, are you happy with this? Or, you, you know, I looked at the game, I found this problem, you think this is good. Those kind of conversations still need to happen. And you need to schedule time for that. If you schedule every single minute of your day to finishing tasks, it's going to be a problem. And this isn't just for people who are managing the team. I actually think people who are on the team need to schedule some of that time too, to look at people who are doing the same kind of work or work on another part of the project so that they can go and say, hey, you know what, I'm the programmer that's working on this game. I know that you're using my tools to uh, you know, uh, build your levels. Are these tools working for you? Are there things that I can add? Hey, I added this thing last week. Is that working out for you? You need to actually schedule some time for that. And usually that doesn't have to be long. You can, in your two hour block, you can probably have two or three of those conversations with different people in your studio. That's one thing that you need to schedule time for. But I want to be clear that it's not just about your office and it's not just about your work. And this gets to the entrepreneurial side of me and the fact that I run a company and the fact that I've been working in the industry a very long time. 
I actually schedule time every week to track down people in my social network, whether they're people in my Rolodex of contacts uh, in the game industry or friends of mine on Facebook that are in the game industry or not in the game industry and see how they're doing. And, and most importantly to schedule, can I help you with whatever it is you're doing? Hey, maybe you're somebody who, uh, you know, is, is doing this kind of, you know, maybe you just released a new product. Hey, do you want me to check that out and play it and tell you what I think about it? Or maybe you, you know, you're, you're, you're posting on Facebook that you're having trouble with this. Maybe I can come help you with that thing. Um, now I know that you expect me at this point to say, and because of that, you get serendipitous things with advance your career and whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's true, but that's not the important bit. The important bit is you get to be the kind of person that helps people. And that's good. That's a happy thing. That's, you know, one of the things that can be alienating in this environment is you are going to spend a lot of time by yourself at a desk working at home alone. And it can get lonely. And the best way that I know to not be lonely like that is to have friends. And the best way that I know to have friends is to be a good friend. And so you need to schedule time to do that. And the, the best thing that I know how to do as a friend is to go out and look and see, are there opportunities for me to help people in my environment? Um, and, you know, I see it all the time. Somebody who's a photographer and trying to start a photography studio. Maybe I know somebody that needs a photographer and I can link those people together. Maybe somebody is uh, trying to work in a new career as a voiceover actor. And I happen to know some people that run voiceover studios and I can link those people together. Right. And I don't know if I ever get any benefit, any financial benefit or whatever from that. It doesn't matter if I do. What I do get is I get to be the kind of guy that is constantly helping people. And sooner or later, someone's going to appreciate that. And I'm going to have friends. And in this environment where you are going to be alone and by yourself working at a desk, you can very quickly not have friends if you're not careful. And this is a, a way that I know how to keep friends and keep involved and keep on top of things. Organizing dinners or organizing, you know, when I go to conventions, organizing, to, you know, some a lot of people who are watching this are people who know me and they know that whenever I go to a convention, I always try to organize a dinner or something. And part of the reason I do this is because that's my social life. That's that's how I have friends. Um, it's not about, you know, trying to find work or dig up. It's none of that. I, I just want to have friends. And I promise you working for 15 years in a work from home environment in a country where every single other person in your studio is in another country, you will quickly lose all your friends if you're not careful. Um, and so not just in the game industry, I look for people all over my social network, people I went to high school with, people I went to college with, you know, people who were friends of mine from different cities that I've lived in. And I'm consistently looking for ways that I can involve myself positively in their lives. That's an important part of how you survive this mentally. Um, and it won't hit you immediately. It won't hit you in the first six months or even year. You'll think everything's fine. But after a couple years of doing this, if you're not doing something like that, it will hit you and it will be problematic. So that's, that's a thing that I would suggest doing. Schedule time to help other people. Um, the last point that I want to make is that you should be thinking about how you can do more with all of this. Right now, I've spoken for literally hours in this video series. And I, if any of you have made it all the way to the end of this with me, thank you so much for being here for all of this. I hope this was useful and interesting to you. I tried to keep it short, but I'm not good at keeping stuff short. I think it's going to end up being a couple hours worth of stuff. But all of this stuff that we've talked about, think about how you can go further with all of it. You have this incredible opportunity and it would be an incredible shame for you to waste it. You know, you're working from anywhere you want to work from. So why are you staying where you are right now? You know, I'm, I'm here because my kids are in school and my family is here. And that's a wonderful opportunity for me to be in Japan and probably an opportunity I wouldn't have. You know, there's not a lot of Japanese companies that would hire me to do what I do right now. If I were to go find another job as a creative director in a studio, it would probably mean leaving Japan. And so for me, I've had I've gotten to take advantage of this enormous opportunity to live in Japan and be around my family and be around this you know interesting culture for you know over 15 years. It's been an incredible experience for me. That's been a way that I could use all of this to do something different with my life. If you're young and you're single, 
Oh my God, the opportunities that you have to, to do things. All you need to do any of this is a decent internet connection, the a computer and a space to work, right? Monitors are cheap. I go down, uh, you know, once a year, I go down to a, a, a Muay Thai gym in Thailand and I work out and get in good shape and fight Muay Thai and have a great time. And when I go down, I bring my laptop, I bring my, my keyboard and a mouse. I buy a monitor when I'm down there. It's only like a hundred bucks for a new monitor anymore, right? And I sit down and I have a workspace that looks a lot like this workspace and I work the same blocks of time that I do now, but I adjust them to my, work, my, my workout schedule. And I spend a month fighting Muay Thai and getting in shape and going down to the beach. And I have a different ritual. You know, when I talked about a ritual at the beginning of this, I have a very different ritual when I'm down in Thailand. And that ritual in Thailand involves three nights a week of hopping on a motor scooter and riding as fast as I can, which is fun, down to the beach and watching the sunset at the beach while I paddle around in the waves and have a good time. I do that three nights a week for a month every year. Because why not, right? You have this incredible opportunity. Don't waste it on not doing cool stuff. You know, are you, if, and, and it doesn't just have to be, you know, this sort of uh, Instagrammable adventure lifestyle. If you're broke and you're trying to start a game company and you're trying to build your first thing, sell your crap, get rid of your house, move back in with your parents and cut your expenses down to nothing. That's exactly what I did when I started BoomZap. That's literally exactly what I did when I started BoomZap. And our monthly expense, you know, my family's monthly expense was basically food. And because of that, I actually had a very long window of time where I didn't have to be profitable that I could build this studio in the first couple of years of this studio. And that's why we're still here today. That was an enormous opportunity that being a virtual studio offered me. I have other friends that, you know, they didn't, and that time I actually was here in this very same attic. Um, and, and you know, I've come back to the attic. It's come full circle. I'm back in the attic now. But I have other friends who uh, got four or five people together, went down to Mexico and rented a house for almost nothing on the beach in Mexico. And they started their startup from a beach house in Mexico. That's a real thing. I have friends that did that. And they were successful. And not just were they successful in running a good business. They were successful in getting to live in a beach house in Mexico for a couple months, which, you know, that's the kind of stuff people, you know, People ask, like, what are you gonna, what do you want to do with your life? Well, I want to make enough money that someday I can go down and retire on the beach in Mexico. These guys were in their 20s and they did it because why not? Mexico's cheaper than a, you know, one of them was from Phoenix. It's cheaper than an apartment in Phoenix. Why not do it? Um, even, and you don't, it doesn't even have to be that something that big, right? You have this incredible freedom. If you're doing all the stuff that I talked about before, if you're doing asynchronous work, if you're judging people by the amount of work that they do and not by the hours that they work, if you're using these working hours as being, this is when you're in communication with other people, but you don't necessarily have to be working then, there's all kinds of interesting, fun stuff that you can do with your life. You could start biking two hours a day and bike four hours a day, six hours a day, whatever you want to do, as long as you're working at night to make up for it, right? You could pick up a work break hobby Right. Um, I actually, you can't see it, but right there on the other side of my desk is an electric drum set. And one thing that I do at the end of my two hour work periods is I sit down at the electric drum set and I practice for about 15 minutes and I get a good solid, you know, 30 minutes to an hour worth of drum practice every single day. And I'm getting reasonably good at it. Right. And that didn't cost me anything except for the $400 that the little drum set cost me. Right. That, there's all kinds of little stuff that you can do like that. Pick up a foreign language. There's all kinds of, or just simply spend time with your family. I live in a house with my family. I get uh, at, at least uh, twice a month. I go to guitar lessons with my daughter and I enjoy having guitar lessons with my daughter. And while I'm doing that, the rest of Japan is commuting home from work. Once a month, I go into Tokyo and I play drums with a bunch of guys who do session events in Tokyo. Why? Because I can. You know, who's to stop me, right? These are just what I do. You do whatever you want with your time. But if you put this whole structure together, if you put a studio together like this, if you put your life together like this, if you lead your life like this, you have given yourself this opportunity to do something really fun and interesting with the time that you've bought for yourself. You know, and I guess if you want, you could... Uh, I guess you could binge watch a whole lot of Netflix, but come on, you knew better than that, right? You know, it, you've bought yourself this incredible amount of freedom 
And the minute that you've done that successfully, my biggest suggestion to you is use it. Use it for something cool. You don't necessarily have to save the world. You don't have to write a novel. You don't have to make your name. Just have a good time. Like a really good time. Not a sitting around, eating popcorn, getting fat, watching Netflix good time. But a, you know, biking and going and seeing stuff good time. Do, I don't want to... You get the point. You've bought yourself this incredible opportunity. Don't waste it. All right, so that's what I've got. And that's the end of the series. Those are the five videos that I intended to make. There may be more stuff after this. I don't know. We'll see what people respond if anybody likes this. My guess is like four people in the world will watch this. But I promised myself I would do it. Um, there's going to be links somewhere when I figure out how to do it. There's going to be a link maybe up here, maybe down there. Maybe, I don't somewhere where it'll show you where the Discord is. That's probably the best place if you want to talk to me about any of this. BoomZap's got a Discord. You can come talk to me about our games, about the way we work, anything like that. I'm happy to talk to you about it there. I do a live stream, uh, which is, again, I'll put a link maybe there. There. I should put it right there. We'll see if I can figure out how to do that. It's going to look really sad if like, I make the video and I can't figure out how to do that. And there's just me pointing to an empty space up there, which is probably how this plays out. We'll see. But any case, um, I do a live stream every now and then. You can watch the live stream. Come ask me questions live there. Um, Thank you so much. If you made it to the end of this video series, I hope this is helpful. If you have any questions, this is gonna be put on YouTube. There's gonna be comments down there. I'll check those. I'll answer any questions anyone has there. Good luck in making this happen. Um, you know, this video was made during the time of the coronavirus, right at the height of the coronavirus. And I hope that in another couple months, all of these coronavirus references seem ridiculous and the world's gotten back to normal and everything's great. I hope that's how this plays out. And I hope when that happens, and the world tells everybody, hey, it's time for you to go back to work and start commuting and start doing this again, that a whole lot of people who have uh, figured out how to make this stuff work better, go back and say, hold on a minute, let's, let's not get too hasty. This all seems to be working. Let's try this whole work from home thing. I hope that happens and I hope, um, if that does happen, I hope that these videos for somebody were a helpful part of that. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Questions below. Be safe.